there is a methodology behind when to go into structure. It's asking the right questions to get the right answers. And I think a lot of people gloss over it. And it's more than just saying, okay, I'm going to buy this in a trust now because someone told me to do it or I bought my second property. It's understanding what's that path to being positive. And you're listening here today, you really need to make sure that that sentence burns into your brain, the path to being positive. If you can achieve that and strategize a way to get there sooner, it's going to give you the best outcome that you can have. But, you know, on the contrary, uh, Emil, some debates that I always have with a lot of clients and us and also other professionals is very simple. Circumstances will dictate when you go into it either earlier or later. If you're a high income earning professional, there might be some significant tax benefits attached to going into structure early because you've got the ability to distribute profits because you have the ability to pay down the debt a lot quicker. So circumstances will dictate in different circumstances for different people, but it will dictate when you go into it either sooner or later in your investment portfolio journey. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dash Dot Insider, the auditory epicenter for passionate property investors seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. Joining me today, a very special guest, and I say that unreservedly because today we are talking once again to our most popular guest, the most popular guest that we've ever had on the Dash Dot podcast, Dash Dot Insider podcast. Jeremy Yanotelli, how's it going? Very well, Emil. Thank you for having me on again and really looking forward to getting to these couple juicy topics. There's going to be a lot of content and a lot of golden nuggets for everybody to listen to. So very excited. Awesome. Well, we had part one uh, that came out last week. And in part one, we were looking at, with Jeremy's expertise in accounting, we were looking at how do you get set up for tax success with your portfolio and some of the key differences, some of the little things that you can do depending on uh, what kind of entity you buy the property in, whether it's with a spouse or with a partner or what the lending setup is, can actually save a couple of thousand dollars a year, maybe three, four, five thousand dollars. If you do that with the lending structure as well, you could be up at eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a year of savings that you can get through efficient uh, structures. And by doing that, that can increase your borrowing capacity by maybe a hundred grand, 150 grand, something like that. It can have a really, really significant effect. On that note, today, we're going to jump straight into our very first question, and this is something that a lot of people want to know. So this is part two of your questions answered by an accountant, an absolute expert in this field, especially when it comes specifically to property. Trusts and property purchases. People are asking us this stuff all the time. Should I buy a property in a trust or should I buy it in my own name? And what are the tax, tax implications of each? Yeah, there's so much noise at the moment, Emil, in this space. I'm seeing um, so many different professionals, whether it's brokers or other accountants, lawyers, individuals, you know, that are, I call them unsolicited advice personnel and, and even a lot of um, a lot of property professionals as well. They're really coming out of the woodworks and they're trying to really engage people into this conversation. You can get into trust, use structure. It's a great way to minimise tax. It's a great way to continue lending. But we really got to understand the crux of it all and what it's there to do originally and then what are the benefits and pros and cons. But we'll start with some very basics first. I'm a big believer and always have been, and this is my personal opinion as an accountant and personal opinion as an individual investor, the first one, two, or even three properties that we purchase in most circumstances should be purchased in your own name. And the reason why we do that, Emil, very openly is we want to keep the cost low, we want to keep it simple, and we want to keep it efficient. A lot of people have the dreams of getting to 5, 10, 15, 20 properties, which is fantastic, but we all know that without you know, to make dreams become reality, we need to take action. And we all know that there's a certain percentage of investors, now with big, large population investing property now, more than it's ever been in the past, but only still a very small percentage of investors, and I believe it's only less than 1% by memory, can get to three or more properties. And the reason for that is not because they don't have the ability to do it, but life gets in the way. They get married, they have children, change of jobs, they could move overseas, they want to maybe start their own business. They may just take a more backward step in life. So there's so many different variables that can occur, Emil as far as why we go into structure later or earlier. Your profession has a, a certain reason as why well. we do it too. It's a really important point that you've just raised there, <laughs> life getting in the way. Your borrowing capacity, if you say 25 single, got a reasonable income, 
and a little bit of capital saved away, or even like 28, 29, something like that. If you're not married and if you don't have children and if you don't have a house, your borrowing capacity, you don't have your own uh, principal place of residence, your borrowing capacity is, you know, X. And it can be pretty good, can be, can be really, really juicy. Suddenly you add um, a child, right? Not necessarily a spouse. Spouse is okay, right? Because the income goes up, right? When, when the bank's looking at it. But you add a child into the mix and you get a principal place of residence and suddenly that borrowing capacity really, really shrinks. And using really, really good accounting strategies and strategies with your lenders that can free up more of the borrowing capacity. That feels like the whole game. And for a long time, I guess, I've never really thought about it until you mentioned it just then, how much of an impact that has on people's property portfolio growth. They start off with a dream when they're, when they're 20, 25, and they're thinking, yeah, I'm going to do this. Suddenly, life hits, bang. And that's probably the key reason why so many property investors don't get past the first property. Absolutely. I see private school fees for many children impacting a lot of families' borrowing capacities. Emil, that's probably one of the biggest things that I see because I get a very in-depth look at you know their personal expenditure and what they're spending their money on being their accountant. But a couple other things I like to consider as well. Many people at a very early stage think, wow, my income's here. Uh, I need to get into, say, specific structure now because if I don't, I'll be tapped out. But if you're very young, you, you're probably at the very start of your career in most circumstances, which means that your income trajectory is only on the way up. And as, a, as we all know, as our income increases, our borrowing capacity increases too. So very specifically, I always say the first one, two, or even three properties we purchase, we should do it in individual names, keep the cost low, keep it efficient. You're most likely at the very start of your investment property portfolio journey. And again, there's only upside to come in as the years go on. Maybe change in policies, interest rates coming down, political changes, tax changes, all little variables, Emil, that will change the way that we can borrow money into the future. But once you've got your first one, two or three properties, then you do want to start to look at structure. And we want to look at structure for these three main reasons. The first reason being asset protection. Um, now, many people, there's this shift in life that I see, Emil, and especially being an accountant now for such a long time, when people kind of get to their mid-30s or late-30s, this mindset changes from being an employee to wanting to be a prop, not a property entrepreneur, a business entrepreneur. And that could be just starting a business maybe as a Preston building consultant, maybe a brickie, a chippy, or even an accountant such as myself. But this mindset changes. So asset protection becomes a very important part of why we do structure. Now, commonly, and this is important for everyone to listen, I actually see more of my clients who start off as salaries and wage employees who wanting to build property portfolios, I actually see a large portion of them as business entrepreneurs within 10 years. Because they know, they know to escape the rat race of being an employee, they can see wealth being derived and built up through property. They know the best way to continue building wealth and borrowing more money is to earn more, is to earn more money. And that comes from being able to control the tempo of how you earn and, and obviously how you spend as well. And business gives you that flexibility of doing it. And if you are a good operator and you are willing to work your backside off to get there, I generally see a lot of business succeed on the back of those you know, CEOs or the back of those managers or directors who are willing to put the hard yards in. So generally speaking, the clients who are investing in properties do transition to being uh, business owners or business entrepreneurs very early on in their working career. So that's just a little bit of an exciting fact that I see. If you're a sole trader, if you're a carpenter, an accountant, something like that, normally if you, if you have a, a disaster at work, something like that, some pipes burst or something like that, your insurance comes in and takes care of it. When you're a business owner, the insurances tend to work a little bit differently. Uh, problems can be a little bit harder to fix and then people can start suing you. Whereas normally people aren't suing the plumber, the insurance is coming in, you say, oh, look, sorry, I'll fix it. When you're the business owner, if something goes really, really wrong, then the ramifications can be somewhat different. You've got employees as well. Employees can cause all sorts of headaches. So siloing away those assets into trust for the asset protection side of things is really, really important. And while that may not seem like that's important at the moment, if you're 25 or 30, you're working for somebody else, as you said, that's that's phenomenal that so many people end up working for themselves, creating their own business within 10 years. They're comfortable with debt, Emil. 
You know, they, they've not, they're not scared anymore. They've got a couple of properties under their belt. They're comfortable with debt. They're comfortable with taking a very calculated risk. And that just is like a little bit of a lead into running your own business. But um, asset protection, coming back to you know, the primary uh, primary concept of what we're discussing, asset protection is first and foremost of why we go into structure. And again, it's structuring your assets for what the future holds. The second reason why we go into structure, whether it's trusts or companies or other things, is for the tax minimization techniques around it. A trust gives us a lot of flexibility, especially when assets or businesses with inside these entities start to make profit, gives us an opportunity to be able to distribute funds. And those funds can be distributed to the beneficiaries that are stated and nominated in the deed itself. So if you've got a lot of family members very close to you, let's say children or husband and wife, or it could be you know brothers and sisters for argument's sake, or mum and dads or great grandchildren if they're above the age of 18. But if you've got quite an extensive beneficiary tree stated inside your deed, you've got an opportunity to really now spread that amount of income that these trusts or unit trusts or potentially companies have the ability to do. So that's a great way to minimize tax. Okay. I think there is a tension between setting things up in trusts and doing things in your own name. Now, you mentioned by the first couple, the first two or three in your own name. Uh, I want to challenge you on that a little bit because we have been getting advice, particularly from mortgage brokers who've been advocating buying in trusts earlier than people may uh, used to. Uh, maybe five, 10 years ago. And the reason for that is to do with changing lending criteria. So while from an accounting perspective, it might be a little bit better to purchase in your own name that first, second, third property before you start working for yourself and the tax benefits become significant and offset any fees associated with the trust. There's also the borrowing capacity component. And this is something we've talked about on the podcast a lot over the last couple of months to the point where some people are saying, geez, you guys are talking about the trust thing a lot (laughs) in in some of the comments. But the way lenders tend to look at properties purchased in a trust is separating it completely from your borrowing capacity calculations. So if you have borrowing capacity X and then you go and you buy a property and then obviously that has income associated, but it also has a lot of debt, then when you want to buy the next property, then the borrowing capacity necessarily goes down. Whereas if you buy that property in a trust, uh, then the lenders, and obviously this is going to depend on the lender, this is not financial advice, make sure you talk to a broker, blah, blah, blah. They can basically silo that away, not include it in the calculations. So you've got borrowing capacity X again. And so you can go again and you're starting from that strong base. So there is maybe a little bit of a tension between which one you should do. Should you do... Like, obviously, when you're getting your your third, fourth, fifth property, trust seems to make a lot more sense. Everyone's in agreement. Earlier on, sometimes it's going to be better in a trust. Sometimes it's going to be better in your own name. So I think that speaks to the importance of talking to someone like yourself, talking to a top broker. Like, we've got got, uh, Callum Rhodes. We do a lot of work with Loans Australia. We've got a few others, Steve McClatchy there, Ona Serrano. We've got a few brokers that have been on the podcast as well. I think the importance is don't just talk to your lender. Talk to your accountants as well. Make sure you get a very, very balanced perspective, preferably if they're working together, and then they can work out a really, really good solution for you. Yeah, so that then takes us to the third reason as to why we potentially do a trust, which is, as you stated, it's the debt negation. So to put it plainly and simply, the trust is an investment vehicle, and if that investment vehicle is producing positive cash flow, i.e. the income is more than the expenses of the assets included inside that investment vehicle, then you've got the ability to negate the debt, meaning you've got the ability to take the debt away from a borrowing capacity point of view, essentially get that back because you have been the one to guarantee the debt with inside the trust, again, set up with a corporate trustee in place. And that gives you an opportunity of buying a separate uh, investment in a separate investment vehicle, otherwise known as a trust. The challenge is at the moment with doing that in many cases, people are using equity from property A to buy you know, a property in the trust itself, a mill. And the challenge is then the property inside the trust becomes 100% leveraged from a tax point of view. And therefore you will in most cases have negative gearing because you're essentially borrowing 100% for the property. Now it's fine if you've got a very strict or very strong business plan attached to the investment that you're purchasing in the trust. 
i.e. it's got a great path to being positive through, you know, the potential to put a granny flat on it, subdivide the back, sell it, could be an additional room, it could be room rentals, it could be a buy, build and sell strategy, it could be a buy, build and hold, but you've got a cosmetic reno attached to a high level of rent. There's various men of many ways to get that X factor involved in the property you're buying to give you a very strong path to being positive a lot quicker. And for those investors that can do that and with 100% leveraged, really be active as an investor to then move forward and execute on the plan, well, then you've got a great path to being able to negate debt and accumulate more property a lot quicker. But for many other people that are out there, they may not have the knowledge or skills to do that just yet. Um, but the borrowing capacity benefits and the debt negation with inside trusts are brilliant as long as you structure it the right way and you are buying the right type of properties. Um, again, I've seen a lot of people that they, you know, Jeremy, we found this property. We want to buy it in a trust to get the debt negation on it because we believe we can get it to positive uh, gearing position or positive geared status, but we do want to move into it in five years. <laughs> and that becomes a real challenge. <laughs> so it <laughs> really is. That's it. it. The business plan of the entire of the entire asset that you're buying becomes so important. So it's matching the business plan, the property, and the structure to get the right outcome. If you can get those three parts of your investment purchase right, plan, um, you know, business structure or the structure of the the business, the property itself, and the structure of the entity. If you can get those three things all humming, then you've got a really solid outcome that you'll achieve on the other side. The couple cons, Emil, that we talk about with structure is obviously the cost to establish. There is a high cost to establish a structure as opposed to buying the property in your own name. And then we've got the running cost of the structure, which will include in most cases, financial set of accounts, tax returns, letters from professionals, ASIC secretarial fees. There's a bunch of costs associated with establishing an owning structure for the long term. And the last one that not many people talk about is land tax. Uh, trust structures for many states are not not favourable from a land tax perspective, although Queensland and WA, where a majority of people are investing, do have thresholds for trusts, you've got other states, for instance, like Victoria and New South Wales, which have very low thresholds for trust. So it's also factoring in these additional costs that may be incurred with owning investments inside a structure and ensuring that those additional costs don't then just go and correlate to the trust becoming negatively geared because it's defeating the purpose of what we're aiming to achieve. Right, okay. It sounds like there's a lot that goes into all of the calculations to determine which way people are going to be better off. So I guess, yeah, definitely talk to Jeremy. <laughs> that's, what that was, that's what my recommendation would be. Talk to Jeremy so we can track the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, definitely in saying that there is, it, there is a methodology behind when to go into structure. It's asking the right questions to get the right answers. Right. And I think a lot of people gloss over it. And it's more than just saying, okay, I'm going to buy this in a trust now because someone told me to do it or I bought my second property. It's understanding what's that path to being positive. And you're listening here today, you really need to make sure that that sentence burns into your brain, the path to being positive. If you can achieve that, and strategize a way to get there sooner, it's going to give you the best outcome that you can have. But, you know, to contra on the contrary, uh, Emil, some debates that I always have with a lot of clients and us and also other professionals is very simple. Circumstances will dictate when you go into it either earlier or later. Um, you know, if you're a high income earning professional, there might be some significant tax benefits attached to going into structure early because you've got the ability to distribute profits because you have the ability to pay down the debt a lot quicker. So circumstances will dictate and different circumstances for different people, but it will dictate when you go into it either sooner or later in your investment portfolio journey. Okay. All right. Well, on that note then, if you're buying your third property, let's say someone's spoken to you, they've spoken to us at Dashdot, they've found a great property, blah, blah, blah. They've already got three properties, let's say two in their own name, one in a trust, they're looking to buy the fourth property. At that point, are you looking at getting another trust for that property? Are we, are we looking at having multiple trusts and are there any challenges associated with that? Yeah, so it's the age old debate of one property per trust. And you read in so many of the books out there that, oh, you know, you should never put multiple assets in one entity, you're defeating the, the asset protection purposes of what the trust is set up to do. But, you know, I, I, I use, I have multiple trusts, I've got significant trust in my portfolio, and I've got multiple properties per trust. So I will put in enough properties in that trust to say, well, if something happens, and everything goes, will it kill me financially? 
if I have, you know, $20 million worth of assets inside one trust, that's a hell of a lot of exposure inside one entity. So we try not to do that. But I like to use a cut method. Um, and a lot of brokers have educated me on this as well. You know, they'll set up, you know, one, two, three trusts over time and property one, two, three will be owned in those one, two, three trusts. But then when it comes to property four, five and six, for argument's sake, Property four is coming back to trust number one, property five is coming back to trust number two, and property six is coming back to trust number three. So if you can think about kind of pouring a little bit of water into each cup and then coming back and pouring a little bit more, that way you're filling up the cup gradually with no risk of overflowing. Okay. That feels like it's a very smart move. And and the more I talk to you, because I know we've had quite a few decent chats now, it feels like if you're a very basic investor, Go talk to your bank, get some lending, buy a property in your own name, whatever. If you're a a more sophisticated investor, you're talking to your broker and you're talking to your accountant together. If you want to be an optimal investor, then you're using a buyer's agent with all of the tech that we have to find the right properties, using the right kind of broker and really upgrading the level of sophistication that you have around the way you do this. And the difference that that can make to a portfolio is absolutely massive, having that right kind of team around who know all of these things because... I mean, a lot of what you're talking about sounds like, okay, that makes a lot of sense, but gee, I'm glad I don't have to do it myself. I'm glad that there are experts that can crunch all of those numbers for me and, and make it make sense because trying to make a decision, if you're, if you're an investor and you're not an accountant and you're not a broker, trying to make a decision about what kind of entity to use and things like that based on a book that you've read, that you've got from Dimex that says, you know, oh yeah, you should, you should buy, you should do this. What are the chances that the author of any book like that actually understands your circumstances properly and the advice that they give you is going to be optimal for, for that set of circumstances? Pretty small. Could work, right? Maybe 5 10% of cases. It might be, okay, yeah, 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 what the book says what pans out. But in the vast majority of cases, you do want to take a more sophisticated approach And even better than that, you want to take an optimal approach. You really want to talk to experts and find out, okay, when am I going into a trust? How many trusts? How many properties per trust? So you're really crunching the numbers. So I think as I said in the last week, uh, when we were talking about the same sort of stuff, it feels like when it comes to property investing, 30 years ago, you could buy a property, sit back, let it grow, get the next one. Things were a bit easier. It was easier to buy property. It took longer to get the borrowing capacity but the properties were cheaper, the yields were a, were okay, the interest rates were very, very high, so people had to wait until they had enough, but it felt like it was a slower game, and it was more relaxed, sort of, oh, yeah, you know, three, four years, five years, look to get the next one. Now, with the speed at which things are changing, optimizing your strategy so you can optimize your borrowing capacity so that you can get into the better properties this month instead of next month seems to be the whole ball game. If we can go on to what are some of the cons of having multiple trusts or potential complications? Yeah, I think the the biggest con of multiple trusts, multiple structures is always going to be just the cost, Emil. Cost is always one of those things where you need to make sure that you weigh up the benefit that you're obtaining or trying to obtain versus the cost of getting that benefit. It's going to be beneficial for you. It's going to get you where you want to be. Other than that, there's no real major cons to having multiple structures. Um, There's probably more pros and more benefits to having it from an asset protection point of view, from a borrowing point of view, and even potentially from a tax minimization point of view. And like anything in life, you know, if you've got the ability to afford to receive these structures or have these structures and receive the benefits that come from it. It's just making sure that, well, what I'm paying, the level of return I'm getting on the other side is substantial. But we we come back, I just want to touch base on one of the comments you spoke about optimization. I feel so many people don't understand efficiency and optimization and what that actually does for you. And I want to really bring that back to the way that my mindset is. There's billion dollar companies, billion dollar REITs, real estate invested listed trusts out there in Australia. You know, you've got your large ones like your 22 billion value of Goodman Group, and then you've got the smaller ones like your GPTs and charter halls of the world. They employ the best minds. They employ the best property strategists. Uh, They employ the best uh, lenders or the banks. They employ the best accountants. They'll employ the best property managers. And they're doing so because they're really after an optimization of returns. 
So you've got billion dollar companies who are employing the best of the best minds out there to buy into these larger, maybe commercial or maybe larger residential real estate areas. They're not really buying mum and dad properties that most of us in Australia will do, but nevertheless, they're having the best minds working on the get, get, working on and obtaining the best outcome they can get. So I really want to put emphasis on what you said. If you can have your great property strategist, your buyer's agent, your great broker, your great accountant, your great legal team, you are replicating on a much smaller basis and a much cheaper basis, no doubt about it, but you are replicating what a billion dollar company does. So I feel a lot of people don't do that. And you know the mindset is, well, they're very big. They've got the capacity to do it. Everyone's got the capacity to do it. It's just making sure that your cost versus the benefit analysis is there, number one. And number two, all the professionals around you are working strategically, getting you where you want to be. Um, I think the big thing that everyone needs to have in the back of their mind is that as you grow wealthier, the professionals around you will grow wealthier with you. You want your professionals to have that mindset. They want to be able to grow with you in wealth as you substantially increase increase your wealth too. And I think having people around you to optimize that process and make that process efficient is important. Don't think that everyone's there just to win because the win may come from your wealth growing with them too. 100%. And right now it really does feel like it's so important. We've had clients come to us and they might have a portfolio set up in a particular way with properties A, B and C. They talk to us and there have been plenty of cases where we've been able to look at that portfolio, the property team uh, and our strategists are able to work out a better strategy for how that particular client can reach their goal. And okay, they can they, they end up with more money, they end up with better performing properties. That That's all great. But the most important two things that it does is we can we tend to set up the portfolios so that there's enough diversification to protect people from ever getting stuck. Well, I'm sure we all know someone who's bought like three or four properties in the same suburb and then they get stuck because that particular suburb isn't, isn't increasing. So making sure that you're getting right locations with a bit of a spread so that your portfolio is always growing in some way. But the other, and I feel like massive benefit is the speed at which people are able to get to their goal if they set things up optimally. If they take the approach of, yeah, this is a good location. I've heard this is a good location. I read some little report somewhere that said, oh, yeah, that's going to boom. I've found a property there. I've gone in. I've overpaid, but it's worth it to get into that location. And uh, I've spoken to the bank, and they've said I can borrow the money for it. So I'm going to get it revalued in six months, and then I'm going to talk to the bank again and see how much more money I can borrow. That, that approach versus having a strategy set out working out, okay, which specific property in that location, which lending structure, what tax structure, all of those things, getting all of that set up properly at the beginning, the difference that can make is like 10, 15 years on your property journey. We've literally had- And hundreds of thousands or millions. Absolutely. We've, We've had clients come to us and they have a portfolio with three or four properties in it. And we actually end up getting them out of a poor performing property and can get people to their result like within a year, the result that they wanted to get to. Uh, sometimes when we're developing a plan, some people might have in their head, look, this is going to take 15 years. And, but by optimizing things can end up being five. And, you know, we've got clients who are on that path at the moment. Maybe we've been working with them for a year, 12 months, 18 months, something like that. And these are bold claims, but they're backed up by all of the stats and, and all of the client portfolios that we have, right? We've sold more than a thousand properties now, uh, to clients, more than 800 clients. I mean, the numbers there are looking really, really firm. We haven't had any big losses, right? We haven't had any losses. We haven't had clients that have said, oh, look, you know, it hasn't worked out. The success rate is really high and it all comes down to that optimization. When you're optimizing to that level, the amount of time that you save on people's property journey ends up being absolutely massive. I want to move into another topic now because I think this is really important. Um, unless you've got anything else that we need to talk about, anything else no, to cover I, with the trust? We're looking good there? No, I think I think they're the main things. I think it's just really understanding and identifying your individual circumstances, chatting with your professional about them, um, and making sure that you are optimising your structure, you're optimising, again, your lending and your purchasing strategy as well to ensure that you're getting where you want to be. Not going to work out perfect. Uh, you can't let pride get in the way sometimes with, again, any, any existing properties that you've got. Sometimes it's great to bite the bullet, move on, and then 
then go in a separate or different direction. But yeah, having a chat with all your professionals, understanding the outcome and the end of where you want to be, and then they can start to piece the puzzle together and that path to get you there. All right. That brings us to the very last question that I have for us today, and that is to do with tax variation and lending. So what are the pros and cons of applying for a PAYG withholding variation? And what is it? <laughs> yeah, so go back, I think, to the very start of what it is. A PYG variation is a submission or a form that you put into the tax office to tell the ATO that, hey, I'm going to incur these certain amount of deductions throughout the financial year. Rather than me waiting to get my tax return in and getting that refund as a lump sum at the end of the year, I would like you to tell my employer that I want them to vary down the tax that I pay based on all these deductions that I'll claim. So what it gives the individual, it gives them an opportunity of reducing the amount of tax that they pay in their weekly, fortnightly or monthly salary and getting that extra bit of income in their hand today as opposed to waiting to a very large lump sum at the end of the financial year. So a significant amount of pros attached to it. It's going to increase your cash flow on a weekly, fortnightly or monthly basis. It's going to give you an opportunity of being able to hold your portfolio much longer with less stress because you're not having to fund the portfolio with a huge amount of after-tax dollars. You're getting a little bit of your refund, as I mentioned, throughout your pay cycles, which is great. Also, if you use it well, you could actually save a bit of interest maybe on your own home or your investment property portfolio because the money that the RBA or the ATO would have had in their bank account, which is your tax dollars, is now potentially in your bank account longer, offsetting any loans that you may have or assisting in offsetting any loans you may have and therefore reducing your interest. So you're making someone else's money or the money you would have received a year, a year down the track work for you today. So there are substantial benefits attached to it. There's not very many cons. The only cons that I have seen in the past, Emil, is that circumstances significantly change and what that may be. They may have had a property which has had substantial amount of renovations or repairs. They're thinking it's going to have significantly more or they may have had a slightly lesser amount of rent per week in the prior financial year where they've based their numbers off. Rents have really shot up and I've seen that happen in very a lot of the areas you guys have been buying in. Rents have almost doubled in two years. And what that does mean is that they've understated their taxable income in their PYG variation form. Essentially, the employer, through the notice that the ATO has provided them, they've taken or withheld not enough tax. So they've got too much benefit from the PYG variation. What that results in at the end of the financial year is a tax payment rather than a tax refund or a very neutral position. So the clients thought, yep, I've got this extra 10, 12, 13, 14 grand in tax benefit through an increase of the amount of pay I'm getting. The accountant's done the return and they've just handed me a bill for $5,000. I don't have the capital to do it because I have not budgeted my money correctly and all of a sudden we get this bill shock. This is why you should not take financial advice from me because I would try that on. I would try that on and I would I would make the phone call to the tax department and say, oh, look, you know, I wasn't expecting this. Uh, yeah, you know, can we work out a little plan? And so that $5,000, that spent time helping me, right, rather than being in the RBA. Like, like I, I do everything that I possibly can to pay the tax as late as I possibly can so that the money's helping me, it's earning interest from me, or it's reducing uh, mortgage payments or whatever investments, whatever interest on any debt that I have, so that it's reducing that. And the tax department, they don't charge a huge amount of interest, but you know, obviously you need to check that for yourself, but I do everything that I can to pay it as late as possible. And you know, I, I sort of, uh, I was inspired by Kerry Packer's outburst uh, when, you know, it's that, that wonderful quotation from him. You know, I, I think the, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but you know the government does a terrible job with the with the tax dollars that they do receive, and I don't believe in donating any extra, right? Or right, doing everything that you can to, to Nails minimize on the head with that one. Yeah, to, to minimize the amount of tax you pay. That's one thing. Also, try to optimize when you pay it for your circumstances. I mean, as long as you as long as you're vaguely sensible about it, the tax department, in my experience, have always been pretty reasonable. Yeah, if you're pretty close to what the figures are, and again, it might be a little bit of refund in your favour, it might be a little bit of payable through some over benefits you've received, but if you do have a very overstated amount 
of tax that you've received back, the tax office do have the right to fine you and penalise you from an interest perspective for significantly understating your taxable income. So you've got to be very careful. Don't don't go too far. Life is about give and take. Um, interest rates that the ATO charge aren't very nice anymore, Emil. They're about 10% or just over. So it, it gets quite nasty very quickly. So they're probably the biggest cons I see with PYG variations. It's just people blase about the numbers and providing the accountant or maybe they might be doing the forms themselves just in a very overstated manner uh, because they think there's no repercussions. I'm getting all the benefit. I'll pay the, pay the ATO later on. Let them chase me. But you just need to be aware of the fines and penalties involved in a significant understatement of taxable income. But the pros of a PYG variation far outweigh the cons, in my personal opinion, because cash in your hand today, the ability to hold your portfolio longer, maybe offset some non-deductible debt through the reduction of tax that you need to pay or have the ability to build up more capital for the next deposit based on the existing portfolio that you've got that's costing you money to keep. I always believe a PYG variation is going to be far substantially better for a majority of people's situations if, on the caveat, they can budget the money accordingly. If you're a person who receives that extra pay each week or fortnight or month and you're going to go spend it and have a hippa hurrah day on it, you will pay for that eventually moving forward in the future. It's that mm-hmm. mindset it's challenge in real no, it's that mindset of getting a 10 grand lump sum at the end of the year versus $200 a week. What's, what's going to be more beneficial for you? It probably does come down to individual circumstances. So to add to what you've said, it's probably my nature. I'd probably try it on. I'd, I'd probably try it on by, with the tax department. But the smart move is not to do that. The smart move is to play that with a pretty straight bat. In terms of should you be pulling it out weekly or fortnightly, monthly, uh, when, whenever you get paid by your employer, should you be trying to get that, that uh, tax refund then? or as a lump sum at the end of the year, all of those benefits you talked about, they're really important, they're really useful, if you have the discipline to treat it like it is savings, to treat it like, oh, this is not just disposable income. Now, at the moment, we do have a cost of living crisis that's just getting worse and worse and worse for a lot of Aussies. So in that case, if it's to pay for essentials, then it might actually make sense. It might actually mean that you can you can survive from, from a, a week-to-week cash flow, not have to get credit card debt, right? Just just pull your tax refund forward a little bit by filling out the, the PA, the variation, the withholding variation. If you can be disciplined about it and if you don't just use it as extra spending because otherwise all you're doing is you're, you're eating away save, essentially savings, the lump sum that you would get at the end of the year. So do be disciplined about it. And to reiterate, don't do what I would probably try on. Play, <laughs> play it with a pretty straight bat. <laughs> otherwise, I mean, I'd end up getting in trouble. Right, it's just my nature. It wouldn't be the first time that I've sort of had to say to the tax department, "Oh, look, guys, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I've, I've got a bit that I need to pay you. I haven't squirreled away enough. Let's w- let's work out a plan." And yeah, I've been lucky because I've always been pretty reasonable with me, but they don't have to be. So so be careful. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that brings us pretty much to the end of part two. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It has been massively valuable. And uh, I think it's really reinforced for me. Once again, get professional advice, not just, you know, any professional, get someone who's a real expert in the property space, not just any accountant, but a property centric accountant such as yourself, who knows all of the ins and outs and the subtleties, right? It's not just filling out a bunch of forms. It's being able to reject, work out how the circum, what the circumstances are now, what they're going to be in five years, what you eventually want to do with this asset, balancing all of those crunching the numbers to come out with an optimal outcome. Because I think as as we keep needing to say more and more and more, it's about optimization now. It's not about, yeah, I've got a property. I'll get another one in four years, maybe five. It's like, no, no, I need to squeeze every dollar that I can out of my portfolio, make it look good on paper for the banks, talk to the right lender so I can get the right borrowing capacity so I can get into the next one, set that up with the right structure that's going to allow me to rinse and repeat. And even though you might be buying the same assets, depending on which path you go down, the speed at which you can acquire them and the tax savings that you get or, or, or the way your portfolio gets optimized at the moment, because the market shifts so quickly, lending criteria change so quickly, all of these things, it really is vital to optimize and to enter that mindset of, no, no, I am trying to optimize the crap out of everything because we're not talking in three, four, five, 10 year timeframes 
in terms of getting the next property. We're talking in six months, we're talking three months, right? That's the speed at which people are able to acquire more properties because of the growth that they're getting in their portfolio. So on that note, thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope to see you on here again sometime soon. Thank you, mate.